Okay, so I'm talking about European frogbit. Um, this species is native to Europe and Northern Asia, but it was actually introduced into North America in the 1930s. It was first introduced into Canada, and then uh, there was a secondary introduction in 1972 in Lake Superior, which was an accidental uh, introduction. And then it was first reported in New York in 1974. But that Lake Superior introduction in the 70s definitely attributes to its pretty small distribution that's centered around the Great Lakes region. Um, but obviously, if you look at that lower map, it is starting to move further into the Northeast. And as uh, Mitch mentioned in the beginning, um, it may be a lot more widespread than what's shown on this map. Uh, in the lower Hudson region, we currently only know about three populations. So it's definitely really important that people start mapping this species. So uh, for identification, the leaves are leathery and heart shaped, and you may be tempted to think that this looks similar to other floating uh, aquatic plants like uh, white water lily, but the leaves are extremely small compared to white water lily. They're only about, you know, a half an inch to two and a half inches. Um, so it's more likely to look uh, like little floating heart. This photo that I've included on the bottom. Uh, this is a native plant, which isn't as common as white water lily, but it is still somewhat uh, present in our water bodies. Um, these also have very small leaves, also heart shaped. The difference, uh, one of the main differences is the sort of wavy leaf margins on this plant, whereas frogbit has smooth uh, entire margins. And frogbit also, you can see in the top image, those leaves are there are several leaves in a cluster per stem, whereas with little floating heart, you're only gonna have one leaf uh, per stem. And uh, European frogbit also has a mid vein that has arenchyma, which is a spongy air-filled tissue, and that's what allows its leaves to float and can appear free floating. The leaves are attached though to a stem, as I mentioned, um, and it does have a developed root system, but the roots aren't extremely strongly bound to the substrate. So we do typically consider this plant as a free floating plant. Um, Frogbit is also stoloniferous. So that means that it sends out stolons, which are kind of similar to an underground rhizome. Um, and that helps to uh, form juvenile plants away from the parent plant. And that contributes to these dense tangled mats of frogbit on the uh, water surface. The uh, plant is dioecious, so that means that it's flowers, it has both male and female flowers on different plants, but most of our populations in New York, at least the ones that we're aware of, are actually only containing one sex. So seed production is pretty unlikely. Uh, still, the flowers are small and white with three petals, and then they also have these uh, greenish red sepals, which uh, form around the flower. So uh, European frogbit is a perennial wetland plant. That means that it comes back every year. And I know that I mentioned seed production is pretty unlikely, but frogbit is able to do this due to its uh, prolific production of turions. So turions are overwintering buds that form on the ends of the stolons of frogbit. And each plant can produce up to 150 of these turions per season. And those buds actually break off and uh, sink in the fall and stay in the sediment and are dormant throughout the winter. And then once the water start to warm up a little bit in the spring, the plant's able to uh, come up to the surface and continue growing or start growing again, rather. It does prefer slow moving water, uh, typically areas of up to two and a half feet deep, but it is free floating. So it doesn't necessarily need to be in water that shallow. It's just, that's where you're more likely gonna find it. Bays, ponds, open marshes, ditches, but also protected areas, coves uh, of lakes and rivers. You can even find it in some wetlands that have very little water. Um, there are a few populations in the lower Hudson region where frogbit is actually formed on these floating wetland mats. So it's not, they're not even fully, you know, submersed in the water. As far as impacts, uh, frogbit is kind of the quintessential aquatic plant. It has pretty much every impact that you can 
that you hear about with aquatic plants. It obviously can outcompete native species for space. And because it's a floating plant and it forms those really tightly packed mats, it's able to shade out those submerged native plants and dominate wetlands. Um, and because it shades out those native submerged plants, it's obviously going to decrease that plant abundance. So that takes away valuable habitat for fish. Um, it can alter oxygen levels, but it uh, can provide some food and cover in absence of those native plants. And in especially in areas where recreation is very important, those mats are going to impact boating, uh, whether that's motorized or you know personal watercraft obviously going to impact fishing and swimming. And those mats are also going to greatly impede water flow. Uh, management and control, this is really important because unfortunately the populations we have in our region are already a little bit too large to be manually managed. And that's why this challenge is going to be really helpful for us um, because we actually do perform manual management of this plant when possible. So in a relatively small uh, population, you can actually hand pull this plant pretty easily because the roots are not very strong, be more free floating. Um, and as long as you're pulling before those turions drop off, you can actually have some great success. Um, in larger infestation, mechanical harvesting might be necessary um, as well as uh, chemical herbicides, which may or may not be po always be possible depending on the water body. And then you can also try and help stabilize shorelines with native plants to reduce excess nutrients. So, um, you know, in areas that have a lot of erosion and, um, you know, more developed areas, sort of repopulating those shorelines with native plants might help with that. 